Hello and welcome to Asia Stream, where we track, report and analyze the issues and interests of the world's largest region. I am Waj Khan, Nikkei Asia's digital editor here in New York City. Today's episode, the U.S. elections impact on Asia. It's Thursday, November 10th. The U.S. midterm elections have come, but they're not gone. We won't know about the final results for days, but here's what we do know. There was no red wave. The Republicans haven't routed anyone. The U.S. Senate is up for grabs, and all eyes are on the southern state of Georgia, which is seeing a second runoff in as many years. While conservatives are inching closer to taking back the House, they will do so with a very slim majority. If the Democrats do lose there, President Joe Biden will still have avoided what happened to the Dems in 1994 and in 2010 under Presidents Clinton and Obama, when the Republicans stormed back into Congress in massive numbers. While the data comes in, pundits are making the following claims. For the Republicans, Trumpism backfired. Being against abortion backfired. Trying to campaign on crime and fear backfired. But inflation, although it is cooling in the US, did hurt the Democrats. That played into rising prices and cost of living, even though the jobs outlook was rosier. But this episode isn't just about the polls. It's also about how the polls may affect the world's largest region. As it's likely that the Republicans will take back the House and the Democrats will probably retain the Senate, will policy on Asia change? Keep in mind, there's bipartisan agreement on many hot-button Asia issues. Nobody in Washington is a fan of China's. Nobody in Washington disagrees about the importance of India. Nobody in Washington thinks that Iran should have a nuclear weapon. But what about those more divisive, middling issues? Troops in Japan, talks with North Korea, coming to Taiwan's defense, investing more in ASEAN, how will the latest school of American legislators shape relations with Asia? Punch your ballots. We've got a great show. You're listening to The Sound of Asia, streaming in your ear. From Nikkei Asia, this is Asia Stream. A reminder that Nikkei Asia is currently offering an exclusive discount for our podcast listeners. Get three months of our award-winning coverage for just $9. To redeem, just click the link in the episode description. Okay, so before we begin, here's your U.S. Elections 101 crash course. Republicans are the conservative party. They run red states. They're also called the GOP, short for the Grand Old Party, as they're, well, the oldest political party in the U.S., dating back to the early days of American democracy. Democrats are the Liberal Party. They run blue states. President Biden is a Democrat. He's also the leader of the party. Most of middle America is red. Most of the coastal states are blue. Those are the basics to start you off in case you don't follow U.S. politics or have been living under a rock, which I wouldn't blame you for considering the cost of living these days. Okay, one more term you'll hear in this episode is the hill. Not the one I'm climbing or the one I'm going to die on, rather the references to Capitol Hill, where Congress operates from. Now, markets have had mixed reactions to the election. In Japan, they're down, as a stronger dollar will only hurt the yen. In the US, they're up as inflation cools down, and the Fed says it's going to start rethinking rate hikes. But guess what? Wall Street actually likes political gridlock, even if most constituents don't. That's because nothing really gets done during times of gridlock, which means investors can have some certainty as they're looking ahead and making plans. And two years of political gridlock is exactly what we're looking at if Dems take the Senate and Republicans take the House. 72 hours ago, though, stability wasn't guaranteed. Our reporting team, myself included, were bracing for impact. Violence and turmoil were expected in certain states. Remember, the shadow of January 6, 2021, when pro-Trump supporters stormed the Capitol, still hangs over American democracy. So, things were tense, and we were watching them closely. To track the hour-by-hour developments, Asia Stream correspondent Monica Hunterhart and I both started to keep a diary to record observations that we could then relay back to you. 
We'll share that diary after our analytical segment. But first, here's Monica Hunter Hart interviewing our returning guest, Tobias Harris, about how these polls will affect American policies in Asia. To discuss the potential impact of these midterms on Asia, we are so excited to bring back to the pod Tobias Harris. He was here earlier this year to discuss former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in the wake of his assassination. If you haven't heard that episode, definitely check it out. Tobias is the Deputy Director of the Asia Program at the German Marshall Fund. Tobias, welcome back to Asia Stream. Thanks for having me back. It's great to be here. So, of course, we don't know all the results of this election yet, but the way that things are heading, it seems like Dems will probably control the Senate and Republicans will probably control the House. That means a more divided Congress. Now, there's actually a lot of bipartisan agreement around U.S. foreign policy towards Asia, particularly around the major players in the region. Um, In some ways, maybe that will be sort of surprising for listeners, given the extreme polarization in this country. But basically, Congress Just to go through some of these main players, um, Congress generally sees India as an ally. It's clearly more at odds with Russia, China, and Iran. Um, But still, there have been some more isolationist candidates that were just elected to Congress. So let's start with those three players that I just mentioned. Um, So Russia, China, and Iran. Might Republicans taking back control of at least one chamber change how the U.S. interacts with them at all in the next two years? Well, on the Russia question, I think, of course, one of the things we saw during the campaign uh, you know, was certain Republicans, particularly on the House side, saying that, you know, they're interested in cutting off uh, funding, you know, U.S. support for Ukraine uh, during, uh, in the next congressional session. Um, but then on the other hand, you've heard, I think, particularly from Senate Republicans, uh, expressions of support for continuing that, even from someone like, uh, you know, a pretty hawkish uh, senator or, or someone like Tom Cotton has said that he wants uh, U.S. support for Ukraine to continue. So uh, there's, you know, this is not, it's not like the Republican Party is now consistently uh, opposed to support for Ukraine. Um, it's something clearly that the Republicans are going to have to figure out amongst themselves. Um, so it is not immediately a catastrophe uh, you know, for U.S. support for Ukraine's war effort. Um, and, and I think all of this should be you know, prefaced as a whole. Um, of course, the president has tremendous power in foreign policy. Um, you know, there's there's oversight power maybe from Congress. Um, and, you know, if the Republicans control the House of Representatives, there might be, uh, you know, hearings and questioning about the aspects of the administration's foreign policy. But let's not forget that the administration is going to continue to have a tremendous amount of, uh, of power and authority in foreign policy. And, that, and that's going to continue uh, regardless of how uh, the final numbers for Congress shake out. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, would you mind just briefly taking us through? So you just mentioned Russia. What about China and Iran? There is a bipartisan, increasingly hawkish consensus in Washington, D.C. on China. I mean, that is just the reality. Um, You know, we could talk about whether it's uh, strategically, whether this consensus is pushing the United States in in maybe too hawkish a direction. But it's clearly an area where I think there is agreement between both parties. You know, we saw the CHIPS Act pass last year. Clearly, that was driven by concerns of of the growing technological competition with China. Uh, So this is clearly an area where... Uh, if anything, the pressure from Congress, again, from members of both parties uh, on the administration is going to be uh, towards competition, uh, making it making it very hard. You know, we've heard from the administration, of course, talk about guardrails and, you know, finding a putting a floor under the relationship and so on. Uh, we haven't gotten a lot of details on that. And I think you know, with this kind of hawkish mood on the Hill, getting uh, clarity on that. I mean, of course, you know, they're going to be watching very carefully for signs that somehow that uh, the administration is not um, is not being tough enough. And so that's, you know, I think something you know, that's just going to be a factor going forward, a, a reality that the administration is going to have to live with. Um, and of course, on Iran, I mean, you know, Republicans, you know, were, of course, adamantly opposed to JCPOA. Um, I think they are going to continue to be adamantly opposed uh, to any sort of uh, constructive diplomacy with Iran. Um and, and and that's just, you know, I, I think that's just a reality uh, of U.S. politics as far as Iran is concerned, that there's just not uh, going to be a lot of uh, domestic political wiggle room maybe um, for, for moving ahead on that front. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to talk um, a, a little bit more about China. So China has, of course, been increasingly interfering in U.S. elections in recent years, even more substantially than Russia has. It's been peddling disinformation, including through fake online social media accounts, exerting powerful influence um, over the Chinese language media here, and even sometimes harassing candidates. Uh, if you'll allow me, just this one absolutely wild example of this. Uh, earlier this year, we watched a man who was a former Tiananmen Square protester, Yan Xiong, lose a Democratic primary in New York City after the U.S. Justice Department filed a claim against a few um, Chinese 
secret police who were actually here trying to smear his campaign with a hired prostitute. And he says that they also pressured the Chinese community in New York to withhold donations from him. So this is the kind of thing that's happening. It's it's pretty wild. Why is China going to all of this effort to influence congressional elections? What are they so afraid of? Uh, you know, that's 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 a good question. And I don't know if I, <laughs> if I have a good answer for it. I mean, I mean, clearly, you know, China you know, has reasons to be concerned about the, this hawkish consensus. I mean, I think um, both what it means for kind of military competition in the region, what it means for, you know, if the U.S. were more determined to support Taiwan, if the U.S. Um, also just, you know, the extent to which the U.S. is now determined to move towards decoupling, um, you know, clearly that's going to, you know, China's going to pay an economic price for that. And so the U.S., I, you know, maybe a lesson of the last decade or so is that the U.S. political system is perhaps open to this kind of subterfuge. The vulnerabilities are there um, and they have the resources uh, to try these sort of uh, these schemes to try to uh, influence American politics in different directions. I mean, is it going to fundamentally change the direction of American politics? Probably not. Um, But it doesn't mean I think that they're going to stop trying. Got it. So Congress is bound by law to the defense of Taiwan. How is that likely to move forward under a divided Congress, uh, particularly if we do have to deal with Chinese aggression against Taipei? Again, I think this is an area where you know there, there does seem to be a lot of consensus. You do hear increasingly, I think, um, again, whether they're right or not, you know, calls, I think, from both sides of the political spectrum, um, suggesting that maybe we need to move you know, to end strategic ambiguity. This is not something um, that seems to have a particular partisan um, affiliation with it. Um, and so we shouldn't necessarily affect, you know, think that the election is going to necessarily change that. I mean, clearly, I think the response, you know, it's driven much more by events, you know, in the region and by perceptions of um, you know, the military balance across the Taiwan Strait. And I mean, that that seems to be a bigger driver than uh, the particular balance um, of power on, on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, what I, what I will say, um, you know, where I think what this election may be uh, tells us or, or points the way towards, and this is not just about Taiwan, but really maybe U.S. alliances in the region more broadly, is that, uh, you know, Trump, uh, you know, Trump's influence with the Republican Party and, you know, certain his brand of politics, you know, kind of questioning alliances, you know, th- you know suggesting that, that U.S. allies were a bunch of free riders and questioning, you know, just how ironclad U.S. commitments would be to its allies. Uh, it does seem like you don't hear that as much from within the Republican Party, that, you know, the U.S. Uh, shouldn't be bound to defend its allies. You just it seems like those ideas don't have the kind of purchase that I think um, was feared uh, during the Trump years. And so that might, I, I think, maybe point you know towards more of a, a bipartisan consensus about U.S. alliances in Asia, like we saw sort of dur- like before Trump, when the one thing the two parties seem to agree on was supporting uh, U.S. alliances in the region. Yeah, that's interesting because I think there were some commentators right before the election um, who were saying, you know, if Republicans do take back some control, it might make allies kind of worry about future stability. Um, Maybe it might point to a potential Republican win in 2024, maybe even a Trump win in 2024. Um, But it seems to have maybe done the opposite, particularly since Trump's candidates really didn't do so well this cycle. I mean, clearly, I think the picture of 2024 looks different today than it did a couple of years ago, a couple of days ago, I should say, when um, Trump was going to declare his candidacy any day now and and was going to roll to the nomination. Um, There's lots of debate about the extent to which kind of raising concerns about American democracy helped the Democratic Party or not. But the point is that I I think voters took those concerns seriously. and it does show that the, there's maybe more uh, resilience in American democracy than perhaps was feared after January 6th. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, the, the Yomiuri Shimbun had an editorial, you know, right after January 6th talking about, um, you know, what the, you know, almost the, the, the shame of American democracy um, that that, that, that you know, incident showed. Um, and maybe there's reason to hope that, you know, American democracy will actually be able to withstand uh, you know, so, you know, the, the kind of post, post-truth attacks, the election denial, uh, you know, a lot of the candidates, you know, running for secretary of state positions and, it, you know, at the state level, um, you know, who denied the, 20, the results of the 2020 election lost. Uh, I mean, clearly, um, it was a victory, uh, not, you know, forget, I, you know, any particular party, but just, you know, for the fact that there might be more resilience in American democracy than uh, I think uh, was feared and, and or, you know, and, and. You know, certainly, I think our allies have hoped for. So um, that seems to be a lesson. 
Yomiuri Shimbun, of course, is a Japanese newspaper, just so that um, our listeners know. Um, okay, so let's talk about um, U.S. defense arrangements in the Indo-Pacific with Japan and South Korea. Biden is pushing for more joint exercises, but also decommissioning assets. How might all of this be affected under a divided Congress? For example, with with the you know, decom- you know moving um, F-15s out of out of Okinawa, you know, the Republicans uh, have been very critical of that. Um, you know, so so clearly, um, again, this is very different than what we saw during the Trump years, where you know reports about Trump threatening to take U.S. troops out of uh, Japan entirely. I mean, clearly, um, you know, there there are now voices really pushing for ensuring that uh, you know the U.S. you know has the assets in place uh, to defend Japan, to meet its commitment to Japan and to the region uh, more broadly. And so, you know, clearly, that's th- that's the tone that you're hearing now. Um, you know, from Republicans on the Hill towards the administration. And and that, I mean, you know, on balance, you know, uh, for the health of the U.S.-Japan relationship, that's not a bad thing, that um, these are the kind of questions that are being asked. Um, you know, is the U.S. government resourcing its commitments properly? Um, is it meeting uh, those those promises? I mean, that that's that's a new, uh, maybe an old tone, but a new tone compared to a few years ago. And that's, so that's not a bad thing. Sticking with East Asia, um, what about talks with North Korea? Might we see Congress pushing to make changes there? Of course, Trump, when he was in power, wanted to engage Kim and Biden does not seem to. Will he be forced to push the needle a little bit in the peninsula by a somewhat, a little bit of a Trumpier Congress? I, I wish we could say that because, frankly, I mean, I, I think what we've seen for the last couple of years is that the old approach, you know, call it strategic patience or whatever you want. I mean, clearly um, it, it is not achieving um I mean, I think any particular goal um, in the Korean Peninsula. I mean, it has not contained the development of North Korea's missiles. It has not slowed, it, you know, sort of the growing sophistication of its nuclear arsenal, its ability to deliver those weapons. Um, and clearly, uh, you know, given that North Korea sanctioned itself effectively during COVID more effectively than, um, you know, years and years of sanctions did, and that it still, um, hit, you know, was able to persevere through that, Um there, there's no path where you're going to sanction North Korea to, to doing what the United States wants. Uh, and given that the signs out of China are that they're not particularly interested in increasing sanctions on uh, North Korea, there's just this is there's no pathway forward in the current um, the, the current approach. Uh, so there is a need for a new approach. I don't know if the pressure for that is going to come from the Hill. I mean, you know, when when Trump was pursuing his diplomacy with North Korea, um, I mean, he seemed to be sort of doing it to some extent on his own. And so it's not like there's it's not like there's a congressional North Korea caucus that's pushing for for diplomacy with with North Korea. I mean, I I mean, I wish I wish there was a more concerted effort on the Hill to say, you know, this is not working. We need you know, we need to be open to doing something different. And it's going to you know because, you know, Congress, of course, has passed a number of sanctions in the law. I mean, it is going to require um you know, cooperation with Congress to really move on that front. Uh, but clearly there's a need for a new approach. Um, you know, if we get that North, you know, North Korean nuclear test, um, you know, the, of course, there's going to be calls to sanction. Is that going to actually accomplish um, the goals of, of reducing the threat posed by North Korea's weapons? I don't think so. So, um, you know, clearly there's a need for new thinking. I'm just not expecting that in this environment you're going to get um, a consistent signal in favor of you know, a new approach. One of the Biden administration's signature projects in the Indo-Pacific is something they're calling the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. It's seen by many as a substitute for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, which the Obama administration joined and worked very hard on, but from which Trump withdrew the U.S. in 2017. Could a divided Congress that has some pro-Trump elements take away momentum from the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework? So, of course, the administration designed IPEF to not require congressional approval. Um, you know, that the basically came right out front and said, this is going to be an executive agreement. This is not going to be, a, you know, a treaty requiring congressional ratification. It's not something that was going to require uh, trade promotion authority, the, the fast track up or down um, uh, agreement essentially between the administration and, and Congress. So so this is not, um, this is not like TPP in that sense. This is not something that formally um, requires um congressional approval to get. And so, so just, you know, from a strictly me- mechanical sense, I mean, this is something, you know, the administration's already engaged in talks, uh, you know, with its partners in the region, um, 
you know, that process is sort of moving along. You know, you had uh, an agreement to start negotiations um, earlier this year. So all of that um, is going on now. Um, you know, of course, I, I don't think, you know, Congress is necessarily as an institution going to be satisfied with that. And I do think, um, you know, they've insisted upon consultations, more information from the administration as these negotiations go forward. But, you know, we should also consider that's not just going to be, uh, you know, a question of, of Republicans, Republican control. I mean, that is also um, from Democrats as well, who want to know what's in, you know, what's going to be in this, uh, what's being promised. Um, and, and there's, you know, no small amount of, of interest and pressure from uh, members of the president's own party on this question. So uh, there's, of course, I think going to be a lot of congressional interest as uh, negotiations proceed, as we start actually seeing the details, because, you know, there's a lot of uh, questions about what actually is going to end up in uh, these nego- these four negotiated pillars, where we know sort of the, the broad headlines, but we don't know uh, real the, really the substance yet. And so I think quite, Congress is going to have a lot of questions um, you know, as those negotiations proceed. Tobias Harris, thank you so much for coming back on Asia Stream. Thank you again for having me. This was a great conversation. That was Monica Hunter-Hart and Tobias Harris. Now, let's time travel and go back to that moment-by-moment and blow-by-blow account to see how things progressed over the first 48 hours of the midterms, starting early morning on Election Day as polls opened and finishing yesterday as the results poured in. Monica was in Brooklyn, and I reported this segment from the Upper West Side here in New York City. It is election day in America, and polls are open across the country. I can't believe it. After 14 long months, the day is here. It is 12.25 p.m., and I'm recording this from the borough of Brooklyn in New York City. The polls have been open since 6 a.m. I visited a local poll site at 9.30. It had a steady flow of people at that time, although it wasn't exactly busy in the way that you see these poll locations look during a presidential election. That's actually really normal because in the U.S., between 10 to 20 percent fewer eligible voters tend to show up for midterm elections compared to when the president is on the ballot. We're unlikely to know whether Democrats or Republicans will control Congress tonight, since many key battleground states don't allow any mail-in ballots to be counted until after the polls close. If the race is a blowout in one direction or the other, we will know pretty quickly. But if it's really close, we may not know who takes control for a week or more. This is, by the way, an election in which Asian Americans are expected to play a decisive role. They're the fastest growing racial or ethnic group in the U.S., and Asian American voter turnout has been surging in recent years. Bloomberg reported that it increased 47 percent from 2016 to 2020, compared to 12 percent for other voters on average. Indian Americans are the largest community of Asian origin in several key battleground states, including Georgia, Michigan, Arizona, and Pennsylvania. Other significant Asian American communities who will be casting votes today include Filipino Americans in Nevada and Hmong Americans in Wisconsin. Hmong is an ethnic group from China and Southeast Asia. Many Hmong came to the U.S. as refugees from Laos after the Vietnam War. We'll see how it all shakes out very soon. I've got the election day jitters myself. are casting their ballots in critical contests. Justice Department plans to monitor polls in 24 states to make sure that they're complying with federal laws. Arizona, a key state we are watching with both Senate and governor race. Maricopa County invested in new tabulation machines in 2019. Officials say 20% of them are having issues where some ballots are not being read. They've clarified that those ballots can either be put into a secure box to later be manually counted uh, or you have the option to recall your ballot and go to another location to vote, according to county officials. But particularly Republicans are already jumping on this, uh, spreading what is being dubbed, frankly, as election misinformation. November 8th, 12.35 p.m. It's lunchtime on Election Day, and I haven't had lunch. I prefer to watch the feeds instead. On my Instagram, I can see from the time on her post that my yoga teacher voted right after her 8 a.m. class today. New Yorkers like to vote early, and that's remained true in these midterms. The city that never sleeps is also extremely Democratic. Just 10% of its 5 million registered voters are Republicans. But turnout is making Katherine Hochul, the governor, a tad nervous. 
She was here in my neighborhood just yesterday, pushing for high turnout. Lee Zeldin, the Republican candidate for governor, has made this race surprisingly close. He chose to campaign at a subway stop in the Bronx last night, where there was a recent stabbing. Violence has risen in the city, especially in these post-COVID years. And he says that Democrats are too soft on crime. But despite Zeldin's efforts, New York is likely to go the typical blue route. It's those developments in other states across this polarized country that are already triggering controversies. We're getting reports of election monitors being rejected in Florida, voting machines failing in Arizona, and more. Okay, time for lunch. More later. Exit polling data starting to come in right as we are coming on the air right now. We are seeing some numbers here that about 27% of voters say abortion was the most important issue. Um, midterm voters generally feel negatively about the Dobbs decision. That's the decision right, that overturned Roe. November 8th, 5.32 p.m. It's dark and the polls close in a few hours in New York, but not everywhere else. After all, this is a country that stretches across a continent. So the last polls will close in Alaska and Hawaii by 1 a.m. my time, long after New Yorkers have gone to bed. Well, at least those New Yorkers who go to bed. But you can't really get a feel for the pulse of the nation here in New York, which is a democratic bastion. For grappling with how polarized this country is, you have to rely on TV, where it's nearly back-to-back -back coverage of reporters from battleground states like Arizona, Pennsylvania and Ohio, re-explaining the key issues of this election. Inflation, abortion, crime, and gun laws. But there are other issues at stake that aren't directly on the ballot. Election denialism, voter suppression, not trusting the vote. I've been covering U.S. elections since I was in college during Bush versus Gore in 2000. Yeah, I'm that old. And while that election did famously go to the courts, it was really in 2020 when Americans just outright started rejecting what the system said were the official results. Was that a part of Trump's red wave in populism? Sure. But the fact that 61% of Republicans went to the polls today with the belief that the 2020 presidential polls were stolen, quote, stolen, surely doesn't bode well for the strength of American democracy. So anyways, it's just about closing time and the stakes are high. Trump has just said that it's going to be a, quote, great day. There are currently 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans in the Senate, so the GOP need one, just one seat, to take control of the Senate and five in the House to regain control of the Congress. Possible? Of course it is. Everything is possible. This is America. Let's focus on Virginia's hotly contested 7th Congressional District. Democratic incumbent Abigail Spanberger is projected to be the winner. It's 11.08 on November 8th, and the results are rolling in. It's too early to know, but so far, analysts still predict that Republicans will win control of Congress, but it doesn't seem like their victory will be as big as expected. That's because there have been some important successes for Democrats. First of all, Abigail Spanberger, a representative from Virginia, won re-election. Her race was considered a bit of a bellwether. If she lost, it was thought to be a sign that Republicans might crush Dems across the board. Democratic New Hampshire Senator Maggie Hassan was re-elected, as was Colorado Senator Michael Bennett, and Josh Shapiro won the Pennsylvania governor's race. There have also been significant wins for Republicans. Conservative Ted Budd won a Senate seat that Dems had hoped to pick up in North Carolina. And here in New York City, one major race went to the Republicans. Incumbent Nicole Maliotakis defeated Max Rose in the House. In the 2018 midterms, Rose won a seat for Democrats that encompasses Staten Island and the tip of Brooklyn, turning the last corner of New York City blue. But he hasn't managed to pull that off since. In other news, Maxwell Alejandro Frost became the first member of Gen Z to enter the U.S. Congress. He is 25 years old. He's a progressive Democrat from the very blue area of Orlando in Florida. I am headed to sleep. More to come tomorrow. Well, I don't understand this. this is not Democrats either. are still... Yeah. They still have a chance of holding on to the this, Senate? This wasn't even a good ripple. Come I mean, on. this, 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 yeah. There's not a red wave. November 9th, just after 9 a.m. The morning after isn't as expected. There was no red wave. The Republicans have won, but haven't won big. The Senate is still up for grabs, as is the House. Closed races are still being watched. But Biden's avoided the worst-case scenario.
the international papers, like the Financial Times, agree with the local papers, like the New York Times, that Trump and Trumpism may have backfired for the Republicans. The most read opinion piece in Bloomberg today is titled, Republicans campaigned on fear, Americans didn't buy it. In the Times, the lead of the analytical piece goes something like this, quote, all the conditions were there for a wave, but in the end, Republicans appear to have generated no more than a red ripple, end quote. Here in New York, Catherine Hochul edged out Lee Zeldin, who did campaign on crime and got closer to Hochul than he was supposed to. But hey, the state now has the first woman elected as governor. Cool, huh? We'll be back. Uh, let's go to Georgia now and begin with that breaking news out of Georgia and the Senate race there. Ellison Barber is in Atlanta for us. Ellison? This race will head to a runoff. It's 3.10 p.m. on November 9th, and the Georgia Senate election race is so close that it's officially going to a runoff, which means this election won't be ending anytime soon. That race could actually determine the balance of power in the entire Senate. So far, Dems and Republicans each have 48 seats. We're waiting to get results from Arizona and Nevada still. The outcome in the House is looking clearer because Republicans are still ahead. If they are successful, many analysts are saying it'll actually be because of the GOP's performance here in New York. Not the city, but the state. Even though Democrats outnumber Republicans in the state by more than two to one, there are many purple districts across the suburban areas. And let me tell you, they are flipping red right now. President Biden knows he's going to be back on his heels if Republicans take over control, no matter how narrowly, and he comes to the mics right now. Well, we had an election yesterday. And uh, it was a good day, I think, for democracy. And I think it was a good day for America. Our democracy has been tested in recent years, but uh, with their votes, uh, the American people have spoken and proven once again that democracy is who we are. Biden's right that it ended up being a good day for American democracy. But control of Congress is still undetermined and will come down to razor-thin margins in several areas. He did push the message yesterday that the slim majority of the GOP means that the American people will expect Congress to work with this White House and not return to the perpetual standoff we saw during the latter Obama years. I'm pretty sure that Biden's legislative leverage will be on his mind when he meets Xi Jinping next week on the sidelines of the G20 in Indonesia. So keep watching the space. That's it for Asia Stream this week. As always, I encourage you to head to Nike Asia at asia.nike.com for more in-depth coverage of the impact of the midterms on Asia and all other things related to the world's largest continent. If you enjoy this podcast, please share, subscribe, and leave us a review. And hopefully, not hopefully, definitely a five-star rating. And a last reminder that Nike Asia is currently offering an exclusive discount for our podcast listeners to get the discount. Click on the link in the episode description or just put out the bat light. This episode was produced by Monica Hunter Hart. I'm your host, Waj Khan. We'll stream again in two weeks. Until then, we'll keep following the election results and watching these great United States try to realize the American stream. You know what they say it's one country under pod. <laughs>